Welcome to Fastlane's Certificate in Security Best Practices presentation. What if you get asked to do this? Please deploy the certificates required to secure this deployment. Here we treat this as a single task that you could complete at the beginning of a deployment or at any time after before a deployment is secured. It doesn't take very long to do this and it's not very hard. It's not very expensive either. If you need to do this, then you need the answers to these questions. Who needs what certificates and why? How do we provide them? This presentation, in conjunction with the dCloud Lab, is designed to answer these questions so you can fulfill the request. What is this presentation about? This presentation provides background information for the dCloud Lab Collaboration Specialist Training Version 2, Security Version 1. The Collaboration Specialist Training Version 2, Security Version 1, dCloud Lab presents two scenarios. Scenario 1, deploy unified CM enterprise level encryption for internal collaboration devices and clients. Scenario 2, Enable end-to-end -end MRA encryption for clients outside the enterprise perimeter. This presentation is broken up into five lessons that have been individually recorded for your convenience. Cryptographic Essentials for Cisco Collaboration. This lesson provides background on cryptographic essentials like symmetric and asymmetric encryption, HMACs, digital signatures, and certificates. The Public Key Infrastructure, PKI, and Cisco Collaboration provide some basic background on the PKI and its relationship with a Cisco Collaboration deployment. Certificates in a Cisco Collaboration deployment. Here we try and answer the question, who needs what certificates and why? Working with certificates in a Cisco Collaboration deployment focuses on how certificates are obtained and deployed. Securing your environment covers some tasks associated with enabling HTTPS, TLS, and SRTP. Securing your Cisco collaboration deployment is not that hard if you understand some basic security concepts. This lesson is designed to help you understand some cryptographic essentials, symmetric and asymmetric keys hash-based message authentication, and certificates. Cryptography, what is it good for? Cryptography provides these services. Authentication, yes, it's really me. Authentication guarantees that a message comes from who it claims to come from. Confidentiality, let's keep this secret. Confidentiality ensures that only the desired party can read the message. Integrity. No change is allowed. Integrity ensures that messages can't be changed without the reader knowing. And non-repudiation. You can't deny you said this. Non-repudiation ensures that if you send a message, you can't later deny that you sent it. These are important services for your collaboration environment. It all starts with encryption. Encryption is the basis for all of our cryptographic services. Encryption provides confidentiality. Encryption uses a key and an algorithm to transform clear text into ciphertext before transmission. Decryption uses a key and an algorithm to transform ciphertext into clear text after transmission. Encryption is used to help provide the other cryptographic services authentication, integrity, and non-repudiation. We'll talk about how this works later in the lesson. Here's a question. There are two basic kinds of encryption algorithms used in communications. Do you know what are the two kinds of algorithms? How do they differ? And what are they used for? To understand the essentials of cryptography, you need to know the answers to these questions. 
There are two kinds of encryption algorithms, symmetric encryption algorithms and asymmetric encryption algorithms. Symmetric encryption uses the same key for encrypting and decrypting. Asymmetric encryption uses one key for encrypting and another for decrypting. Symmetric encryption is more efficient and can handle high rates of data throughput. Asymmetric encryption is slower and less efficient. Symmetric keys are simple to generate, while asymmetric keys have a special structure that makes them harder to generate. Symmetric keys are short-lived. They are typically used for a single conversation, while asymmetric keys are long-lived and can last for years. Examples of symmetric encryption algorithms are AES with 128 and 256 bit keys. Both key lengths are used in Cisco collaboration for different purposes. DES and triple DES. These are older protocols and are not used in Cisco collaboration. Some examples of asymmetric encryption algorithms are RSA, 1024, 2048, and 4096 bit keys. Key lengths up to 2048 bits are supported prior to CSR 11.5. In CSR 11.5, key lengths of 4096 bits are supported. ECDSA, or Elliptical Curve Digital Signature Algorithm, is a cryptographic algorithm used by Bitcoin to ensure that funds can only be spent by the rightful owners. This is new in 11.0 for the Call Manager service and new in 11.5 for the Tomcat service. Symmetric encryption is fast, but keys are hard to manage. Use symmetric keys for individual sessions where lots of data is exchanged. Protocols using symmetric encryption include TLS, Transport Layer Security, and HTTPS. HTTPS runs on top of TLS. SRTP for secure voice and video sessions. IPsec. Key management. How we generate and exchange keys is an issue with shared symmetric keys. Both parties need the same shared key. We need a different key for every session. Keys are short-lived and must be changed frequently. The key needs to be secret. We need a way to exchange the key in secret. But the whole purpose of the key is to allow us to exchange information in secret. We need to be able to exchange the key. See the problem? So we need to secretly exchange many keys with many different parties. It's easy to generate a shared key, but how can we manage exchanging them with other parties? Asymmetric encryption is slow, but keys are easier to manage. We can use asymmetric keys to encrypt small amounts of data. For example, encrypting symmetric keys. We can use asymmetric encryption to exchange our symmetric keys. Digital signatures that provide authentication and non-repudiation services. Key management is easier. Parties have a key pair that lasts a long time, months or years. We have to exchange keys far less often. One key is published. Public keys are available for everyone to see and are easy to verify. The other key is private. Private keys are kept in a secret local store and are never exchanged with anyone. If you encrypt a message with the public key, you decrypt it with the private key. If you encrypt a message with the private key, you decrypt it with the public key. Asymmetric encryption only works because it's very hard to derive the private key from the public key. We can use asymmetric encryption to exchange our shared symmetric keys. How does this work? One party generates a shared symmetric key. That key needs to be exchanged with the other party. The party that generated the shared key uses the public key of the other party to encrypt the shared key and send it. The other party uses their private key to decrypt the shared key. But wait! How do we get the public keys of the parties with whom we want to communicate? The public key is not secret, so it doesn't need to be encrypted. But we need to be sure a public key is authentic. We need to know that the key we get is the real key. 
we need to be sure that the key hasn't somehow been changed. The key belongs to the party to whom we think it belongs. What if someone impersonates that party and sends us a fake key? How can we be sure that a message hasn't been changed? We need to verify the integrity of messages that we receive, and in particular, we need to verify the integrity of public keys we might use in communications. We can use a hash to verify message integrity. Messages are hashed into small fixed length digest or fingerprint that gets appended to the message. The receiver hashes the message as well and compares the generated hash with the fingerprint on the received message. The hash generated by the receiver needs to match the one generated by the sender and appended to the message. Hashes are one way. It's impossible to recover the hashed message from the digest. Algorithms include MD5 and SHA. Cisco collaboration applications use SHA-1 and SHA-2. But everyone knows the hash algorithm. Someone can change the message and then generate a new hash. So this isn't good enough. Hash-based message authentication codes, or HMACs, solve this problem. We can protect against a message being intercepted and change if we add a secret key to the data before hashing it. The secret key is symmetric shared, and so must be known by both parties. The secret key provides authentication and integrity assurance. It's not perfect. The receiver could pretend to be the sender. No non-repudiation. HMAC is fast. We only encrypt a small amount of data, the hash. Keyed SHA-1 HMAC is used in IP telephony for signaling and media protection. HMAC isn't going to help with distributing public keys because we need a shared key to use to create the hash. Remember, we want to use public keys to help with exchanging shared keys, not use shared keys to help exchange public keys. Digital signatures start with a hash of the message. The first step in signing a message is to create a hash using an algorithm like SHA-1. A shared symmetric key is not included in the hash. Only the message contents are hashed. Digital signatures are appended to messages just like regular digests, but the digest is first encrypted using an asymmetric private key. The digest can only be decrypted using the corresponding public key. Digital signatures go beyond HMACs. They provide authentication and integrity assurance like HMACs, but also provide non-repudiation are based on asymmetric encryption. There's a public key and a private key. Are slower than HMAC, so not good for real-time traffic. Here's how it works. The sender hashes the message to create a digest. The digest is small and a fixed length. The sender encrypts the digest with its private key. Only the digest is encrypted. The encrypted digest is called the signature. The signature is added to the message, and the message is sent. Here's how it works. The receiver uses the sender's public key to decrypt the signature on the message to get the unencrypted digest generated by the sender. The receiver hashes the message to create a digest. Then the receiver compares the two digests to validate that they are the same. All we need for this is to be able to get the public key of the party with whom we wish to communicate. Digital signatures are used for certificates. We need the public key of the other party in a conversation. Certificates are used to exchange public keys. They are a big part of the public key infrastructure, or PKI. A certificate is a signed document that authenticates the identity of a subject and provides their public key. If you have a certificate that's properly signed, then you can be sure that the key provided and the subject identified are both correct. Certificates contain the public key of the subject, the issuer of the certificate, the dates for which the certificate is valid, and other important information. The issuer of the certificate is important. The issuer is the one whose private key is used to sign the certificate. 
How do we exchange public keys? We can just send each other certificates containing our public keys. This is pretty simple. All we need is a certificate for our public key. But certificates need to be signed. Who's going to sign our certificates? Why don't we just sign them ourselves? It doesn't get any easier than that. Then each party can send their public key in a certificate that's signed by their own private key. What could go wrong with that? If I use my private key to sign a certificate containing my public key, that's called a self-signed certificate. Self-signed certificates are bad. Anyone can create a fake self-signed certificate by generating their own public-private key pair, putting whatever they want in the certificate, including a fake public key, and then sign it with the corresponding fake private key. Self-signed certificates can never be verified and represent a security risk. We need a way to distribute public keys. We need to find a way to avoid the problem of self-signed certificates. What's happening in Cisco Collaboration? Or, why should we care? Here are some slides from the Cisco Live 2017 presentation, What's New in Cisco Collaboration? Overview of what's new and changed across the Collaboration Systems release to help us move from theory to practice. The column, Symmetric Algorithm, shows the algorithms used to encrypt bulk data transmission. The hash algorithm is the algorithm used to produce hashes for HMAX and digital signatures, and the elliptical curve and RSA columns indicate the asymmetric algorithms for digital signatures and certificates. Currently, AES with a 128-bit encryption key is used for shared symmetric keys. AES uses HMAX SHA-1 as the authentication method. These algorithms can't effectively scale to meet the required changing security and performance needs. Currently, certificates are signed using RSA with a 2048-bit key size. With Cisco Unified Communications Manager release 10.52, AES-256 encryption support for TLS and SIP SRTP is enhanced to focus on support in signaling and media encryption. Support for TLS 1.2 using AES-256 and SHA-2 for SIP trunks is provided. SHA-2 is a set of algorithms including SHA-224, SHA-256, SHA-384, and SHA-512. Support for the elliptical curve digital signature algorithm and larger RSA key sizes is coming in 11.5 and 11.6. Some products now support elliptical curve digital signature algorithm, ECDSA certificates, but for simplicity, the general recommendation from the Enterprise Collaboration CVD version 11.6 is to use RSA-based certificates. Why do we care? The government cares. Why do we care? The payment card industry cares. For the payment card industry, soon you will be forced to disable TLS 1.0, 1.1, and use only TLS 1.2, and ciphers and certificates must be secure. In this lesson, we learn some cryptographic essentials. We encrypt sessions using a shared symmetric key. Encryption with symmetric keys is fast. We exchange the shared key using the public-private asymmetric keys. Encryption with asymmetric keys is slow, but the keys are valid for a long time and are easier to manage. HMAX can be used to guarantee the authenticity and integrity of a message, especially if they use a key. Digital signatures are better than HMAX and are used for certificates. We use certificates to exchange public keys but we still don't have all the answers for distributing or publishing public keys. Who signs the certificates? We know we can't sign them ourselves. How do we get certificates for our public keys if someone else has to sign them? We use a public key infrastructure, PKI, to solve these final problems. That's our next lesson. Thank you for taking the time to watch our video. We hope you enjoyed it.